Thank you, Greg, and thanks to all the organizers for this opportunity. Uh, I won't um, endeavor to go through the title. It's a mouthful, but we're going to talk about RV strain. So in terms of evaluating the right ventricle, Greg had mentioned that it's now viewed as something that's important. We previously really focused on the left ventricle, and it was often the eyeball check to say, oh, the RV looks all right. We can use two-dimensional measurements and measure fractional area change. And with the advent of three-dimensional echocardiography and, of course, MRI, we can actually get much more accurate volume-based measurements of the right ventricle. What we typically use in echocardiography is TAPSI, or the tricuspid annular systolic excursion by placing an M mode across the lateral annulus. And this is really quite a reproducible, easy to obtain measure, similar to using tissue Doppler and measuring S prime velocity, again from the lateral base of the right ventricle. The two disadvantages of these techniques are it is influenced by translation, and the right ventricle does move quite briskly. And the second thing is it can evaluate only regional function. So you may have what appears to be normal at the base, but altered function in the mid and apical segments. And so we move on to this new modality that we have, or relatively new, which is strain. And strain really is a measure of myocardial deformation it looks at the change in length compared to original length. And for the heart and the muscles, which are relaxing and contracting, we can see that that is something that's quite useful. This cartoon here shows that if you start at 10 centimeters and shorten, you get negative strain. So the minus just says the muscle is contracting. And when it relaxes or elongates, we say it's positive strain. And this is really a bit confusing, and many people now have started just looking at absolute strain. We can also compute strain rate. It's the velocity gradient between two points divided by the distance, or it's the rate of change in strain, and the unit is per second. Now, what are the types of modalities through which we can get strain? So it started off with tissue Doppler strain, and this is really um, a very sort of um, elegant modality, especially if you want high temporal resolution. The limitation is it's Doppler-based, and therefore you have to really line up against that RV free wall. And if you're not parallel to the motion, you're going to underestimate strain. And most of the literature only looked at basal and mid right ventricular strain. The sample needs to be tracked throughout the cardiac cycle, and therefore it's quite onerous and often done in dark rooms where there are research fellows. Now, when we look at two-dimensional strain, with the advent of two-dimensional strain, this is a technique that we can actually practically use because it's much less time consuming, there's less inter-observer variability, and what it does is really track ultrasonic speckles within the myocardium and look at where those speckles change. Bear in mind that you need high frame rates for acquisition. It is angle independent. Now, for the ventricle, we can measure longitudinal, radial, and circumferential. The RV is thin-walled, and really it's longitudinal strain that we typically measure. There are groups in Europe now who are trying to actually measure a radial component as well, but it's really not available on standard commercial systems. And the third type we can use is what's called velocity vector imaging, which is sort of a combination. It tracks the endocardial border plus the speckle. And there is good correlation between MRI and tissue Doppler and 2D speckle strain, but this data relates to the left ventricle. What about the right ventricle? So all 2D strain is only as good as the 2D image quality. The RV has smaller thickness, larger excursion, 
lower quality of speckles, and therefore feasibility is a bit less than tracking the left ventricle. The ASC guidelines from 2015 recommend we use our RV focus view, and I'll show you that. We don't have dedicated software for the right ventricle, and we currently use left ventricular software, and we only evaluate it in a single plane, bearing in mind that RV function is predominantly comprised by that longitudinal contraction. So this is a standard apical four chamber, but if you were to measure strain, you'll have difficulty tracking out there laterally in the apex as compared to a RV focus view, which we get by moving down and laterally. And the main sort of importance is to be able to get to that RV apex. You need to adjust depth. Make sure that you get the whole annular excursion. If you zoom in on it, you'll find there are bits and diastole where the annulus actually is outside the imaging plane. You may overgain a little bit. You need to adjust your sector width so you get a good frame rate and avoid variation with respiration. All up with a bit of practice feasibility is about 90%. What you need to do in practical terms, avoid non-standard views and use some of those landmarks like the Cori sinus or the aortic valve. We don't want to see them when we're looking at the RV focus view. And if you have images with suboptimal quality or with rib artifact, you will get erroneous 2D strain measurements. Now, some of you may have been at the workshop, but essentially what we do is use the left ventricular strain package. We usually trace six segments, and then we measure free wall strain, which is an average of basal, mid, and apical segments. So this was work done by Ime Chia when she worked with us. She looked at 142 healthy volunteers. This was a multi-ethnic population. And when you look at an average strain of three segments of the free wall, the mean value in these healthy controls was minus 27%. If you take six segments, including the septum, the RV strain is actually lower. And she showed that Although it's small, there is a gradation with RV strain decreasing with age, and also that RV strain is a little bit lower in males than females. Um, another paper, this is from the Mayo Group. So they looked at 116 normal subjects and then did a meta-analysis of a further 10 studies in the literature. And despite that, the total number is only about 500 normal subjects. And the free wall strain came up at minus 27 plus minus 2%. So a confidence interval between 24 to 29%. And this most recent paper from the group in Padua, Louis Badano and colleagues, what they examined was should we measure six segment strain or should we measure three segment strain? And while it looks complicated, all I want to show you here is they looked at six segment RV strain, so they just traced the six segments, but they did a mathematical average of the three free wall segments. Here they actually did a GLS average, and then they just drew a three segment region of interest. What they found was the feasibility of doing that three segment strain was actually much lower because you don't actually hitch against the apex, and if you use an arrhythmic mean, as we see here, the values are higher and correlate better with using just a free three-segment three strain. Again, the mean values were quite similar, average of about 26% higher in women than in men. And whether it's global, free wall, or septal, strain seems to be higher in females. So for any lab, decide what your protocol is going to be whether you're going to draw six segments, whether you're going to take an arrhythmic mean of the lateral three segments, or whether it's going to be an average of six segments. And they also showed good inter- and intra-observer variability. Now, where can we apply all these fancy metrics? Certainly, to evaluate the right ventricle is obvious. Adult, adult congenital heart disease, pulmonary hypertension, connective tissue disorders, infiltrative disease, arrhythmogenic right ventricle, it also has prognostic value, and there's a couple of emerging studies 
to show that you can use it in the therapeutic um, arena as well. So let's look at its value in pulmonary hypertension. This is a fairly old study of 80 patients. And they divided right ventricular strain into tertiles and looked at the lowest group as being an RV strain less than minus 12%. So in a patient with normal function, you see the average strain is about 20. In those with pulmonary hypertension, significantly reduced. They showed correlation with clinical and echocardiographic parameters, as well as right heart parameters, and lower survival in the group with low RV strain. Importantly, you can see when you divide tertiles that those with lower strain had worse disease, they had more drug treatments, and they actually had worse prognosis when you follow them up. This was a larger study from Garvin Kane's group, where they again looked at a group of patients with pulmonary hypertension. Feasibility again reported in terms of measurement about 88%. And you can see here that it's a large group, almost 600 patients, those without hyper pulmonary hypertension having higher RV strain. And this is shown nicely graphically. So in the group with no pulmonary hypertension, we see strains over 25%. And when they followed them out for survival, as well as MACE events, you see that those in the lowest quartile do much worse. In the treatment of pulmonary hypertension, an early study which had a small group of patients showing that strain actually did improve in patients who responded to specific treatments. A more recent study, which actually quantified how much strain improved by, and they said if strain improved by 5%, would these patients do better? And when they followed them up over time, an improvement in RV strain greater than 5% was associated with improved survival. What's interesting is that RV strain doesn't appear to be limited just to conditions which affect the right ventricle. This is a recent study from last year looking at patients with acute decompensated heart failure. And there are, what we have to get our head around is that most cardiological diseases can involve the left ventricle but also the right ventricle and being thin-walled, it may show a signal before the left ventricle actually shows some abnormality. So they had about 600 patients, and 215 of them reached an endpoint of MACE or death. And when you looked at stratifying them, uh, right ventricular free wall strain of less than 13% was associated with worse survival. And this was true whether it was HEF-REF, so heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. I'm not showing you a busy slide which did a multivariate analysis, but this RV strain came out as an independent predictor even when you added left ventricular metrics. So an important tip. So we may be strong in our echo skills with 2D and previous um, measurements, it is important to actually practice some of these developed normal standards for our labs and techniques. Limitations, so we, we can't use Doppler and 2D interchangeably. There are problems with standardization, especially across different vendor platforms. As I alluded to, three segment versus seg segments, no dedicated software, and it's only as good as the 2D image, but if you focus on the 2D image you get, it has a high feasibility. So in summary, evaluation of the right ventricle is limited by its complex geometry. RV global longitudinal strain is certainly showing promise to be able to identify right ventricular as well as general cardiomyopathic processes. It's been demonstrated, albeit in small groups, to have prognostic value. Can we use it to evaluate therapeutic benefit, particularly in specialized groups of patients? Is there a value in pre-op assessment? This is something that we've never really thought of, and for valves in valvular heart disease. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>